Hi, everybody. This is Dave Shady, your Alaska Director of the Division of Agriculture. So welcome to another Facebook Live on Thursday. Today, I've got Kevin Folks from FFA. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about FFA and the new sponsorship. But before we get started, I want to really thank the governor and the legislature for bringing the FFA sponsorship over to the Division of Ag. That, uh, the budget passed yesterday. Yeah, I think people saw that. And I really always try to acknowledge and thank all of those that support agriculture. And in this case, uh, the transfer of the FFA program into the Division of Ag. So with that, Kevin, uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and how you, how you got up here. All right, be happy to. Thanks, Dave. Um, like Dave said, my name is Kevin Fox. I, I grew up on a a ranch in Montana, cattle ranch, hay, and we had a little bit of grain too, but uh, we raised about 400 Red Angus and Hereford Cross animals. So I've been involved with agriculture all my life. And I went to Montana State, got my degree at Montana State in ag education and uh, started teaching in the state of Montana, taught 32 years in Montana, taught six years in a little town called Hobson. And then uh, uh, went back and got my master's degree and then went to move to Livingston and taught 26 years there. So, and then I retired from teaching and, uh, decided I wasn't ready to be retired yet. So I, so I, uh, started looking for some, something else that would still keep me involved with FFA, you know, so, cause I always saw the things that it did for kids. So, uh, I started looking and, uh, this job opened up and, I came up here in uh, December of 14. So I'm working on eight years now being the state FFA advisor. So, wow. So, yeah. so doesn't seem like eight years. Seems right. like. Uh, so why don't you just, before we talk about the history in Alaska, why don't you explain what the state advisor does? Maybe I'm not sure everybody knows that. Okay. Um, so I oversee all the FFA chapters in the state. Um, right now we've got uh, 10 chapters, active chapters. Um, so I work with advisors and uh, we provide programming for at the state level. Um, our big event we just completed was our state convention. That's one of our bigger events, but we try to visit all the chapters in the fall. Um, I oversee the state, state officers that have just recently got elected at state convention too. So we do some leadership training with them. Like I say, we go out and visit all the chapters in the fall. Um, we'll put on, uh, help the, the chapter advisors host district events. So we have four, four districts in the state, um, Interior District, Matsu District, Kenai District, and uh, what's the other one? The, well, the uh, South, uh, Southeast District. Okay. So don't have a lot of active chapters down there yet. We lost some with COVID and stuff, so. Yeah, that was that was a big challenge. So why don't we go back and maybe you can talk a little bit about the history. When did FFA start up here and and kind of how has it developed and then maybe where we see it going would be the next question after that. Yeah, so um, FFA is really in its infancy in Alaska. They didn't, the state didn't get chartered until 1976. And, you know, in the lower 48, when you'd look at chapters down there, they were started in in the late 20s, early 30s. So so we, we got a late start um, and uh, it's been a fairly small organization. When I started in 2014, there were, there were uh, 125 members and uh, six chapters. And okay. so we grew that to 18 and had 500 members pre-COVID and then COVID kind of hammered everything and uh, we're, we're down. We're actually sitting at 299 members right now. I need one more member to make 300. So, um, and uh, 10 active chapters. We, you know, we've got some chapters that uh, we're hoping to get started, but it's been a real challenge with COVID. You know, um, doing everything virtually and then on Zoom makes it makes it a challenge. So now, uh, now maybe we can get back into the norm and get growing again. We we were adding about two to three chapters a year. And I think we can continue doing that, you know, once we get back doing things alive. So. Well, and I, and I think, you know, for the last couple of years, you've uh, been able to, you know, incorporate Zoom in, in the meetings and do some of the things. So as bad as COVID has been, it's also given you some opportunities, I think, uh, yeah. to in the communication realm. So, um, you know, I, 
I, I don't know if people know the difference between 4-H and FFA and how that works. So maybe you can describe a little bit of those differences and, and uh, you know, what a model program would look if somebody is, is looking to, you know, some ag teacher or some school wants to look at a program. Yeah, I'd say the biggest difference is, is, a, is a high school uh, ag program is, uh, is taught in the school. So, John, maybe... If you don't mind, John's putting up a slide. It might help explain a little bit. But um, whereas the 4-H is a club, we see FFA as being an intercurricular part of the program. So we have a high school teacher that's teaching agriculture to the students. And then, the, you know, the model for FFA, if you want to look at the screen, is basically... Um, I call it three circles or three gears, and they they all work together. You have a uh, you have the ag and natural resource education program where you're teaching classroom, you know maybe shop skills, and uh, and then you tie that in with uh, uh, students. We we want all our students to have a supervised ag experience, some type of work experience, or some type of entrepreneurship ownership type project where they're learning skills from being employed or, mm -hmm. or running their own business or operation. That might be owning livestock. It might be working at the local feed store, you know? So it's a, a big variety. And then you tie that in with the FFA and the leadership activities and the things that uh, students learn from FFA. And with those three uh, gears, I guess you would say, they, uh, they give a real complete education, you know? Unlike, you know, I, I think it should be the model for a lot of different subject areas, um, you know, science, math, all those subject areas should have that. But the nice thing is, is the kids are not only just gaining from the classroom experience, but they're gaining from their work experience. Right. They're gaining from the things they do in FFA. And I think um, those three gears tie together to make a real comprehensive program that kids can learn from, learn good life skills. So, so actually the governor asked me the other day is like, so, so is this going to help young people get into farming? And I said, well, it gives them those skills. So maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the leadership skills and the other things, because it's not just agriculture, but it gives them life skills in general. And then maybe you can talk about how that incorporates into your state convention, which, which just got done. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, I talked about some of the leadership activities we do, but we're involving our kids in a lot of, uh, of events throughout the year. We call them LDEs and CDEs, Leadership Development Events, LDEs, and Career Development Events, CDEs. Um, when you look at uh, our uh, calendar, we, we host some of these events at the district level, and then we put them all on at the state level. So our state convention, our CDE events were... Uh, some of them were vet science, uh, ag mechanics, mm -hmm. um, environmental natural resources, um, just to give you a look at uh, maybe with some activities that would happen in environmental natural resources. The students had different stations where they, they tested water quality. They tested, uh, they had to identify soils and talk about the characteristics of soils. They had a GPS station where they had to go out and, and, uh, plot some waypoints and determine some elevations and figure some acreages. Right. Um, so that's just some of the skills that they might learn in a, in one of our CDE events. And then in our LD events, we actually have competitions in prepared speaking, uh, public speaking, extemporaneous speaking, where they have a short time to prepare a speech and deliver it. Um, parliamentary procedure. Um, we have a creed speaking contest. We have a, um, this year we had an ag issues contest with kind of the focus of that contest was, was um, climate change and how it's impacting our state. So, so, you know, putting kids in a situation where they have to, to uh, speak to one another, probably the biggest uh, LDE that I see is really uh, something that's a true life skill is uh, our employment skills contest. And that's where students have to have to make a resume, they have to do a letter of application for a job, and then they have to literally interview for a job, mock, do a mock interview for a job. So um, it's, a, it's a life skill that everybody's gonna face sometimes. Yeah, you're, you're so, gonna need to do that. Yeah. 
So, if, you know, one of the things I didn't do, which we always do, is if you have questions for Kevin or, or myself uh, in the chat, put them down and we, we definitely uh, hope uh, have a few minutes to do that. So one of the things um, that happened last year that I was pretty excited about was uh, you took some folks to nationals uh, and they did pretty well. So why don't, let's brag on, on your folks and, and how they did, because I, I think that's a really bragging uh, point for Alaska. Well, thanks, you know, for, for as little, little of a membership as we have, I think we've been really successful. I know, you know, one thing that I've started was the district competitions and, you know, my advisors, when I first came up here said, we want to be more competitive at state and national levels. And I said, you know, we aren't going to be competitive if all we do is go to state. We need to, we need to do some activities that, you know, will help test what kids ability so that's where we started district events and that's helped some but um, every year we try to take a, a delegation to a national convention so um, the teams that have won our state event mm -hmm. then are qualified to compete in those events at nationals so all those events i was talking about earlier those are our national events too um, we also have students that apply for what are called proficiency awards, and that's based on that SAE, that work experience or that ownership that, that I was talking about. And uh, this year, uh, we had a, uh, a winner from Seward in outdoor recreation. We had a national winner. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank right now, but uh, Cody, um, is uh, a national winner in outdoor recreation. The first one we've had in the state, his SAE was based on his work experience with his dad on a charter boat. His dad owned a charter boat out of Seward, so he's fishing. So the, the SAE was uh, outdoor recreation. Uh, we've, had, we've had kids that have done uh, real well. Um, we've had kids that placed in the silver division, which is usually the top 10 mm -hmm. in environmental natural resources. A couple of years so uh, we've done well in those events and then we've uh, had students that get their american degree which is the highest degree you can you can uh, receive in ffa and uh, every year we've had two to four four of our members that are usually after they get out of high school apply for the american degree so wow so so we've had some successes and having a national winner like say in the outdoor recreation was a first for our state so and then, uh, I'll keep thinking about the name. I'm sorry I got the name. <laughs> well, that's great. So, you know, one of the things that, that, that we probably should talk a little bit about is the change in sponsorship. And so, you know, uh, I think I'm excited about having the FFA sponsorship switched into the state system under the Division of Ag, something that, that um, I think we talked about for about a year and, and that's come together. The governor supported that. And so, you know, maybe you can explain kind of the support of your program and, and how that works. And then we'll talk about your changes of location and how we're doing things. And, you know, I know we're in a, in a state of transition and it'll take us a little while. So maybe you can fill people in on where we're at. Yeah, so um, we're excited about the move. We, uh, you know, uh, last couple of years, we've done our uh, convention virtually because of COVID. So we've done everything through Zoom. And um, and two years ago, you know, we approached you about doing our convention, at least hosting it from, from the division building. And we appreciate your support in that. And then last year, uh, in particular, we were able to do our convention Facebook Live out of this facility right here, this room that we're in. And it worked out really well. And, you know, some of the conversation, I guess, led to, you know, uh, some possible change to move to a location that maybe understands agriculture and uh, will support what we're doing. And so uh, we're uh, excited about uh, having legislative support and a governor's support and and making a move to the division. And I think it's going to be a good, great partnership. Really, we're we're uh, really excited about the move. So. Well, tell them what suite you're in because you're you're you should be moved in by the end of the week. Yeah, here. so yeah, I actually been moving into uh, suite seven here in in the division. Um, they were uh, generous enough to lease a new office space and uh, got new paint, new carpet, and uh, so we'll be housed uh, right here 
1801 uh, South Margaret, where the division yeah. is, fish and game, the troopers uh, for the wildlife are all in this building here. And so uh, you're a welcome addition to, to the, the team. So yeah, and I, I think there's, you know, there, there's, it'll be a great partnership. There's some things that, that we parallel each other and can help each other out. And then I think it'll be great to, you know, use expertise and division to, to help us out too. And uh, I think we're, you know, we're all on the same mission. We're trying to grow agriculture in the state and whatever we can do to make that happen. I think it's really important. Is, uh, I think it's important for our economy and I think it's important for our, for our youth too to see. see yeah, and, and one of the things that I wanted to make sure people understood is what we did is we, we're, we're doing the administrative support and it's still gonna be run by the board. And so you have a board of directors and you have your own foundation, which is still separate. What we're doing is helping you with the administrative overhead in that. And I think that is a really, really good model to where we, we handle, you know, all of the administrative travel, all those kind of things that a small organization would have a difficult time running on their own, but you have the community that's, that is giving the direction and the national and the state boards. And I think that's really good to where, you know, you, you keep tied together with that national mission, but you have the ability to bring it into the state and make it work for Alaska, so. Yeah, and, and that's great. You know, the National FFA recognizes our board of directors uh, locally as overseeing the program that happens in the state and, and uh, appreciate that. Uh, I guess you would call it somewhat autonomy to do the things that we need to do to grow our program and but yet have support from the state to, to make things happen and have some funding to, to uh, make it a successful program. Because I, you know, it's, uh, it's a great program. I've just over the years, I've just seen the impact that FFA has on kids. And, uh, you know, I was a coach. I coached uh, football and wrestling and track when I was teaching. And, and I granted, they're great, they're great builders of character and great leadership activities for, uh, for students. But when I compare them to what I did as an FFA advisor at the local level, I just, I see a lot, a lot more weight on the, on the things that the kids did in FFA and, and the life skills they received. Not saying that it, involving kids is, in anything at that level is great, but I just saw the potential and, and, the, and also the direction that kids would go when they, uh, when they left the program. You know, I had kids as a teacher that had nothing to do with agriculture when they went and entered my program as freshmen. And then when they, you know, I, one in particular, he's managing, he's running a 10,000 acre ranch in Montana now, <laughs> selling hay and cattle and grain. And he came to my class in sandals and shorts and says, what am I doing in this program? <laughs> Counselor put me here. Why am I in this class? And, you know, so. Uh, the counselor so, saw something in him, didn't he? Yeah, and he, I says, well, why don't you, why don't you try it for a week? And if you want to stay, you can. If not, I'll sign your drop ad. And after a week went by, he, he decided he was going to stick with it. And he ended up going through my program, being a state officer in Montana and uh, actually visited with, a, was one of few people when the president of the United States visited Montana to tour agriculture in the state. He was picked to spend two days with the president. Well, that's so, pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Went on, got a degree in vet science and ended up, okay. he's on a ranch now. Yeah. So that's, I guess that's a success story that I like to, to talk about because you know you can take kids at that age and show them the potential that there is in agriculture yeah. and sometimes i think we have a misnomer about agriculture we assume it's all um cows and plows you know but there's oh, a huge industry. industry in agriculture that doesn't do a uh, deal with raising livestock or raising crops you know yeah huge industry so so john do we have any any questions on our channel we sure do. We've got a couple here. Okay. And so the first one is, what is the uh, best way for an ordinary person to support FFA and get more students to participate? Well, an ordinary student, what I would encourage you to do is to try to find a local chapter that you can get your student or son or daughter involved in. Um, we do have some homeschool chapters across the state. 
Um, we, we're, uh, we have chapters that are associated with IDEA homeschools and we have chapters that are associated with focus homeschools. So um, we actually have uh, six FFA chapters that are associated with homeschools too. So, so if there isn't a chapter, um, the other thing I guess would be to give me a call and uh, maybe- Why don't you give can, me your number then? Yeah, my cell number is 907-707-9710. And, uh, and let me read off my new number because I'm just learning the division number since our move. Uh, so my phone at the Division of Ag is 907-761-3884. Uh, but uh, if there's not a chapter, you know, my goal is always to grow chapters and, uh, and uh, we can work with your local schools and maybe try to get a chapter established if there isn't one, so. I want to back up a little bit too. The Cody Bryden, I could not there think of Cody's last name, but Cody Bryden from Seward was our national proficiency winner. So Cody's going to school at UAF and uh, doing a great job. I just don't know why I drew a blank on his last name, but great kid. Because you're in front of camera. Yeah. <laughs> I think, okay. I think probably part of that question was wondering also if someone uh, maybe doesn't isn't a kid who could sign up for FFA or doesn't have a kid that could sign up for FFA, but they still want to support it in some way. Is there ways that they can volunteer or help spread the word or uh, donate funds? Or, you know, what kind of ways can people get involved? You know, we have, we really appreciate any volunteerism. We do have a foundation. Um, and we do take support, you know, in the form of donations. Matter of fact, from our transition there in the last few months, we that's what we've been operating on is our, our foundation dollars. So, so yes, we uh, take uh, support in uh, in the, in that manner, and and then my state convention, um, you know, to put on these events and put on that big event, um, you know, typically we'll have 150 students participating in those. CDE and LDE events I was talking about, and we need a huge number of volunteers for that. Um, my list of volunteers is about 130 strong, and, and we use a good share of those to make that event happen. So um, love to have your help. And if you, ha if you have a background with FFA, you know, it's a surprising how many people I run into that talk about FFA, you know, came from from uh, through an FFA program and want to help, I'd be happy to get your name on our list of volunteers. And, uh, and then even at the local level, if you can connect with your local advisor, I'm sure they're always willing for, looking for assistance with activities too. So. Uh, Roger is wondering, do you have any chapters located in more urban or suburban based schools, i.e. Anchorage, Fairbanks, et cetera, there are some great examples of very successful secondary school agriculture programs located in urban settings. Yeah, so we do have a program in uh, Fairbanks. Silent Springs FFA is in, in Fairbanks and the North Pole chapter uh, in North Pole. Um, we uh, had a program at Hutchison School in Fairbanks. Um, that program, uh, the teacher moved and the program kind of went went away or not away, but we're trying to, you know, we'd love to have an, an advisor step in and start that program, get that program going again. Um, we're working with King Career Center in Anchorage um, to try to get a program established there. Um, it's been slow going with COVID, but we're hoping, like I said earlier, that maybe we can get some things moving. Um, so, and our biggest chapter right now is in Palmer um, by far. Uh, large number of kids, uh, two ag education instructors in Palmer, and they're doing a fantastic job. And, and I guess if I was going to look at a model program, I think they're, they'd be the one you'd want to check out. Um, we've got a chapter in Delta, um, but Fairbanks. And uh, then we also have a, uh, we have a homeschool chapter called Midnight Sun in Anchorage also. So, so those are some possibilities that, you know, as far as the bigger areas in the state, bigger communities. Uh, KC seconds that motion, motion regarding just questions about uh, chapters in Anchorage and adds that there are uh, commercial farms there that are non-traditional, you know, the vertical indoor farming. I'm wondering if FFA's had any connection with those or, or uh, any experience with that. Um, you know, we've, uh, 
actually a couple of years ago, one of our big projects when we were doing uh, doing our state convention virtually, one of our service projects was to, to build grow towers. Um, so we did a project to show our chapters how to build grow towers and, and grow uh, plants hydroponically. So um, yeah, so we've had some experience um, as far as teaching kids some of those methods, but uh, and have uh, visited with a few of the people involved in that process. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a neat process. Um, you know, uh, plant science and horticulture, a big part of, of what uh, ag local programs would be teaching. And so uh, whatever we can do to teach kids how to grow their own food or grow food for others is definitely on the radar. Definitely. I and mean, one of the things John was helping you with the convention, and I remember uh, he, he made a statement, and you can back this up because he's sitting here, but he said, well, looking at all these students I've worked with this week, he goes, the future is bright. These are wonderful kids. And, you know, that just speaks to, to the fact that while in the, the turbulent world we live in, there are still some bright, wonderful kids. And these are the kind of programs that drive them forward. You know, when I when I took over as the commission as the director, we started talking FFA and our commissioner Commissioner Feige started uh, reciting the creed. <laughs> and then I can't even do that. I was like, <laughs> okay, boss, I guess you know a little bit about FFA. And so, you know, like you said, there's a lot of people that it's impacted their lives, and they've gone on to do a lot of things that weren't necessarily directly related to agriculture, and then their lives come back around to where it is tangent again, and that so. It, it is really cool. So I always let the guest have the last word. So did we miss anything or anything else to add? Well, you know, I'll, I'll kind of parallel what you're saying too. And I, I guess I look at, look at um, getting kids involved in agriculture. If they, if they don't grow up on a farm or ranch or maybe their uncle or their grandparents are farmers or ranchers or they're close to a neighbor that puts them to work, you know, there is, isn't really, you know, once they, uh, get out of high school and go into college a lot of times they don't see that opportunity that exists so if we can show them that there's opportunity at a young age you know we're, we're letting uh, FFA members start in uh, middle school so sixth grade on through 12th grade so you know if they see that opportunity and and uh, I don't know I I just see the opportunity in our state now especially opening up new land just yep. strictly for ag agriculture use is uh, those opportunities don't exist in other states. So I, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity to get kids involved in, in agriculture. And I think it's, a, I think it's gonna be an important part of the Alaska economy because uh, you know, the writing's on the wall, I guess, with oil production and in the future, you know, it's, uh, it's gonna get slowly uh, put aside and we're gonna have to find something else for our economy and maybe agriculture is is that, well, yeah, is Governor that Dunleavy has yeah. said agriculture will be one of the cornerstones of our economic recovery. And, yeah. you know, the, he and the legislature definitely have, have supported us. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's well, pretty exciting. So we appreciate, appreciate his support and the legislative supports from both sides of the aisle on, on, uh, on this move to the division. And we're looking forward to the future. I think we're extremely excited about the direction we're going with, with our programs and, uh, and want to thank you and, and everybody involved with that process. So, well, you're welcome. I, I I thought it was just an absolute perfect fit when we started talking a couple of years ago, and with the governor's leadership, my commissioner, and that, uh, you know, that that all came together. And then, like you said, I think we have almost unanimous, if not unanimous, support in the legislature. I, I've never heard of any negativity, and that's really cool when you have everybody agreeing that this is something that's important. And I think people really believe in our kids and in what what. What, what the future brings. So with that, uh, if we don't have any further questions, John, we're, we're gonna call it a day. Uh, next week, we're gonna talk about uh, the land sales we just were talking about and uh, Mo, Eric Mo Johnson is gonna be in and we've got a big uh, kind of shindig going on June uh, 10th and 11th up at Nanana for our Ag Day for up there. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So remind people that, hey, come on up to Nanana during that time. So till next week, thanks all. Thank you.